From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Terry Griffin and Emily Carls talk about the economics of transitioning from conventional crop production to organic production as a means of diversifying farm income. They studied the likelihood of succeeding with such a conversion economically and the factors that would influence that. Then this week's highlights from the Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. This time, Brad White, Bob Larson, Bob Weber, and Dustin Pendle will talk about preparing for the upcoming calving season and about the state of the cattle production cycle, what that means to you producers. Further ahead, K-State's Charlie Lee on eastern cottontail rabbits and why their numbers are slowly declining. All this and more here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We're glad to have you along once more. Net farm income and profitability on the farm or ranch, always a high point of interest in agricultural country. A recent study out of K-State took another look at some possibilities for profitability if one converts from conventional farming to organic production. Our guests are precision agricultural economist Terry Griffin, K-State Research and Extension, and a graduate researcher in agricultural economics who's been working with Terry on this project, Emily Carls. So, Terry, what caused you and Emily to want to look at this comparison of returns to conventional versus organic farm production? Well, in 2014, as a lot of people have noted, um, commodity prices substantially went down. So we had a period of 2014, 2015, and 2016 where net farm incomes were low, input costs remained high, machinery costs remained relatively high, and, and this was following a, a three-year period of relatively good years that were, um, that'd be 2011, 2012, uh, 2013. And so we were comparing the good years to the bad years, and the logical question was, well, what separates the most profitable and least profitable farmers during this time period? And the follow-up question is, well, what alternatives could they have? And and there's been a lot of debate around organics and whether it's a philosophical or a profit maximization decision, what factors would lead a conventional farmer to consider producing organic corn? And, and the idea would be to try to increase revenue to capture that premium from higher corn prices for organic markets. So you and Emily were looking at this purely from the economic vantage point, not necessarily the philosophical angle. It was completely economic, looking at it from a profit-maximizing farmer's perspective. And the keystone here would be input costs, would it not, by and large? Uh, input cost, and also the transition from conventional to organic may imply that the three years of transition Corn couldn't be sowed as organic. It'd still have to be sowed or consumed as conventional, but without the use of some of the same input. So that's a costly venture in itself. Emily, you did the heavy lifting on this research, <laughs> so we want to bring you in and fill in the details. Mm-hmm. You were seeking to answer specific questions in this, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. We wanted to really give the producers um, knowledge on In those good and bad years, you know, where should they focus more of their management efforts on um, as far as the net farm income? And then um, looking for ways to diversify their operations. You know, we're told time and time again that diversification can help mitigate some of that risk um, involved in net farm income variability. So um, organic was one of them that we we came up with and one that hasn't really been researched much as far as um, from the profit maximizing standpoint. So we really wanted to dig into that and, and try to figure out some stuff with that. So how did you dig into it? What did you use for data or uh, numbers to crunch, if you will? Right. So we we did more of a case study approach. We used um, a base farm from Illinois, actually, and 
Um, We looked at different situations or scenarios that would lead to it being more profitable uh, for that specific farm to maybe transition into organic or some only some of their acres into organic. You might not always put all of your acres into organic production, but diversifying it a little bit and adding some into organic could help with um, some of the price risk that you have as far as dropping commodity prices for especially corn and soybeans. So So you say some variables needed to be weighed here. What were those variables? Yeah, so we looked at everything ranging from days suitable for field work for machinery management decisions and the different machinery implements you'll need going from conventional to organic and how often you need to take those through the field without being able to use synthetic fertilizer and herbicide and pesticide use in organic production. The field operations are quite a bit different, so we looked at that aspect of it. We looked at the price aspect of it, of course, as well as um, the cost management aspect of it as well. We also looked at three different yields. So you had mm-hmm. you know, the whole spectrum of some of the lowest yields during that transition time period as well as the most optimistic yields during this time period and and as we evaluated sort of the bookends and and also one that's sort of in the middle a an expected corn yield. Mm -hmm. Or when a transition is being made one would suspect anyway that the the yields might not be as stable as staying with the original conventional system. Yes, yes. There's been plenty of research out there that has shown that it um, you have an initial especially initial decrease in yield when you start to transition to organic because you don't have like I said earlier the use of the synthetic pesticides or fertilizer but there also has been some research that shows that you can recoup some of those yields after you've been producing organically for about 3 to 5 years. What did you find out about the competitiveness if you will of the transition toward organic from conventional economically speaking then? Yeah, so there's definitely a learning curve to it. As we've talked to some of the producers that are out there in organic as well as in this research, um, there's quite a big learning curve um, to only transition maybe 20, 30 acres of field at a time. And that way, um, there's a lot of the accounting, record-keeping aspect of it. It takes a lot to get the records under control. So um, trying to transition everything at once leads to kind of a mess when it comes to record-keeping and everything you have to um have to become certified organic. That was a big aspect of it. And then we found it it wasn't as profitable um, until you got into the higher yield scenarios. Again, this was just on the one base farm, one base case in Illinois. So these results can change as you go to different regions of the country, different crops. One of the limitations of it was that we only looked at a corn rotation. So one of the things moving forward we'd like to look at is adding more crops into that rotation to make this a more realistic or more sound research. So when a farmer is considering transitioning into organic, they don't plan on doing it just for one year. So you right. know, there's three years of transition and this fourth year of actually selling organic corn. That's mm-hmm. not the end game there. It's, you know, but there is a decision. Am I going to do this for 10 years? Will I do this maybe for 15 or 30 mm-hmm. years? That commitment is essential, isn't it's it, to commitment. make this work? And in no cases would the farmer recoup their expenses if they just did it one year. So that was part of Emily's evaluation was how many years do we need to commit to this before it returns a profit? And the definitive answer was? Well, we looked at the three different scenarios, um, like Dr. Griffin mentioned earlier. So it depends on what your price premium or what your costs are, what yield you're getting, um, that kind of thing. But for the most part, we looked at what organic price do you need to make it make it even at every level of planning horizon is, is how we termed it so 5 10 15 years and it ranged anywhere from even our best case scenario i think it you actually immediately started seeing the profit once you transitioned all the way down to you needed 14 15 dollar organic corn to make it profitable so just depends on where you're looking as far as your yield expectation and and costs. But by and large, once one bridges, if you will, from conventional to organic, makes that transition fully, it would appear that the profitability is there to sustain that organic production? Yeah, after a given number of years, some of the scenarios, it was shortly after the three years, some of the other yield scenarios, it took closer to five or 10 years to recoup all of those losses. So it again just depends on. You know, if you think it this way, you know, the worst case scenario during this three year transition, you could uh, just imagine you still mm-hmm. have land expenses, which isn't cheap, but you have no 
revenue from selling anything. And so, so how does a producer cover that gap? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. Um, well, you said earlier, I mean, you, you don't do the whole farm. farm small yeah, area. yeah, and that helps. Every farm is going to be different as far as um, what they can manage and, and the best transition path forward. So that's something that moving forward, I think people considering transitioning to organic would need the most help on and, and really individualized help because it depends on every operation is so specific. And yes, starting with transitioning small acres at a time. So you, you have that time for a learning curve. So Emily looked at, you know, let's say a 2,000, 3,000 acre farm who wanted to have 500 acres in organic. Well, they wouldn't do all 500 acres of those in year one. They may do a 40 acre field year one and then next three years it'd be transitioning and second year take another field and start it in the process so the rest of the farm wouldn't have to cover all of those acres at the same time but there's also we got to think about this is that it's not only on the production side we're relying heavily that the consumer side will demand organic Mm -hmm. into the future not only demand it but also be willing to pay a premium for those products and you can make some arguments, you know, is this a niche market? You know, how many farmers can actually do this before they right. bid away at all the premiums? And so uh, we didn't get into that level of aggregation. We looked at this as an individual farm entering into this market. Mm-hmm. Will this work be available to producers to review in the relatively near future, Emily? Yeah, we're hoping to um, get a couple of publications out on Ag Manager as well as some other small um, papers and um, educational journals. Thorough and good work and shedding light on a question that, uh, surprisingly enough, really hasn't been studied that much mm-hmm. up to now. So, Emily, congratulations on the research. Thank you for being over and visiting with us. Yes, thank you very much. And Terry, as always, appreciate you being my side. Thank you, Eric. Joining Terry Griffin, Precision Agricultural Economist, K-State Research and Extension, a graduate researcher in the Department of Agricultural Economics at K-State, Emily Carls, and Emily's work focusing on the economic comparison of conventional and organic farm production. Look for it soon on agmanager.info, the summary of that work. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. It's time now for a segment from the latest episode of the Cattle Chat Podcast. Director of the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, Brad White, hosts BCI faculty Bob Larson, Dustin Pindle, and Bob Weber. The group is discussing calving preparation and the cattle cycle. Hi, welcome to BCI Cattle Chat. I'm Brad White, and we're happy to have you join us today as we're going to discuss a couple things. We're going to talk about calving prep. There are some things that you can do at this point to kind of get ready for that calving season before it gets here. And then we'll talk about the cattle cycle, so the economic cycle that we go through with cattle. For me, calving season is always comes as a little bit of a surprise that, hey, we're starting to have calves. So I think talking about that now is a great idea. So we are hopefully, I mean, for a lot of herds, a couple of months at least away from calving. Uh, A few things that I want to do. I want to make sure the cows are in good body condition, that I've got the feed and forage that I need to keep them in good body condition all the way through calving. If I wait till the last minute, it's harder to catch up. It's harder to catch up. So I want to keep them in good body condition and kind of keep an eye on the weather. If we have a nice open winter with not a lot of uh, really cold temperatures, I don't need as much feed, but I need to be prepared for a difficult winter and really be able to respond to that so that the cows don't get behind. And then I think you can also start thinking about the actual calving. So the supplies I need, do I have the equipment that I need? Are they working? Are they clean? Are they ready to go? And really Build the kit now, yeah. right before you need it. That's smart. When you're out in the barn and you yeah. need it right now, it's pretty hard to, to do yeah. that. So. I think looking ahead to, you know, actually planning to help those cows that might need assistance, I really like a place to bring them in or a strategy where I'm going to handle those cows that are having a difficult birth. Posts are set, boards are replaced, we're we're ready to go. Yeah, we're ready clean. to go and 
and, and, you, and your colostrum supplement on hand, you know, yep. all the the ER kind of stuff you might need. Get that stuff ahead of time. And I like the idea of building your calving kit. And also, as we come through, as you've got the preg check data on your cows, if you do, you make a list so you know who's going to calve and, well, and you've got some ideas. Maybe into calving groups. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, it just so happens that uh, Kansas State University Extension does a number of calving schools around the state. And again, this is a good time of year to kind of get that refresher if you're ready for it. One of the other things that we think about as we go into calving is how do I kind of plan for maintaining, because I know sanitation is critical to preventing calf scours. What can I do at this stage to kind of plan for that? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I, there's really two things that when I think about scours that I really want to do. Oh, I'm going to say three things. One, make sure the cows are in good body condition so that they have that calf, good healthy calf, good healthy cow. The next thing is sanitation. So some of that has to do with, again, if I'm going to be using a pasture or a calving area, is is to not put any cows on it until as late as possible, to keep the turf present, to make a good, clean calving environment so that I haven't run cows on an area where I want to keep my calves. If I'm going to use a barn or something to bring... The spot we've been feeding hay all winter is not the best choice. That is not the best choice to have your calves born. Just everything we can think about from sanitation, everything we can do to prevent mud and manure buildup now, as well as to have a place where that is going to be a minimal problem. So again, an area that's easy to clean, an area that gets good sunlight, can get dried. So the worst type of situation would be an area that tends to be wet and stay wet. That's not a good place to plan on having calving and young calves. But what about, you mentioned if I have a calving pen... They calve in the pen, and then in the next day or two, whenever I get to it, I kick them out. I keep them there, and then I kick out the ones that have calved. Can, that, I, can I solve most of my problems that way? That's a really common strategy, and it's, it's not a bad strategy. The key there is to keep that calving area clean, and it gets harder as the calving season goes along. If you have a really short calving season, that can work pretty well. Again, if you're still able to keep that area clean, again, it can't be an area that tends to get wet and stay wet in those types of situations. My favorite, though, and, and a lot of people probably have heard of the Sandhills calving system, named after some, some work done in Nebraska, the Sandhills in Nebraska, and it's based on two things. One is sanitation, putting cows that are about ready to calve on brand new pastures so that those are clean pastures, they're ready to go. And then what we also call age segregation, a young calf, a calf that's just one or two or three days old, his worst enemy is actually a slightly older calf, that calf that is five, six, seven weeks of age, by five, six, or seven weeks of age, those calves are kind of past the risk period for getting scours, but they still shed a lot of those germs that cause scours. So what I'd like to keep is my brand new baby calves who are the most susceptible away from those older cousins out there that are really shedding a lot of germs. So this Sandhill system involves basically multiple calving pastures. And if you really follow the system the way it's written, Every cow that has not calved yet goes to a new calving pasture every two weeks. So basically, on this calving pasture, everybody that calves there this two weeks, they stay there. And if they didn't calve the first two weeks and the next two weeks, they move to a a new clean pasture and they get a chance to calve on that new clean pasture. So basically, you're moving our cows that are still pregnant away from the rest of the cows every two weeks. And that's the core concept is you... You move the ones that are yet to calve, because even in the scenario I described, if they're they're born into that pasture, they can become contaminated or pick up those pathogens in the first couple days of life. And particularly, think about those calves that are are not born at the very beginning of the calving season. They're probably going to be born on a pretty clean calving pasture. But here we are three, four, five weeks into the calving season. Those are calves that, even trying to keep them on a fairly clean pasture um, or a fairly clean calving area, yeah, there's been four weeks of calving and cows on this pasture already, and it's harder to maintain the sanitation. Last thing we wanted to hit on was the cattle cycle. And what is the, when, when people talk about the cattle cycle or the 10 year cattle cycle, what, what does that mean? So the cattle cycle, which you said is 10 years, it's approximately average, what, 8 to 12? I mean, they've had one that went out to 14. On average, it's about a 10 year period where. The, the herd size, right, is expanding and it's um, contracting, and, that thing, yep. and probably because of profits, right? So, that, yeah, that's kind of basically the cattle cycle. So, so as the herd expands, the profitability goes down. 
the herd shrinks, profitability goes up. You see new entrants to the market and entrants leave. And right. that's, that's what drives that. So when people talk about the cattle cycle, you, you could talk about it from a supply and demand side, or you could talk about it from just the economics of what the cattle price is doing. Fair? Right. And so there are a lot of factors that are driving that, whether you're talking about consumer demand or you're talking about you know droughts, I mean, various demand or supply issues. Yeah. Where are we now in that process? That's a great question, and it's been kind of a challenge to figure out a little bit in terms of, you know, we had 2014, right? Record calf prices, uh, record profitability for cow-calf producers. Most of the stuff I've read recently suggests maybe, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, much more pressure on calf prices or revenues for cow-calf profits. For cow-calf so when you say pressure on calf prices, meaning we're going to have a greater supply and calf prices will be dropping during those periods, yep. or maybe that's... We'll kind of hit the, what, the trough the bottom, the bottom the, the of trough, that, yep. and then and we'll so start. We'll go back up, and so that's, yep. you know, roughly, as, as Dustin pointed out, four to six years from... Top to bottom or bottom yep. to top. So it takes a while to put cows in production or take cows out of production. Because once you, I mean, even if I made the decision today, I want to save heifers, it's a few years before yeah, I get calves that enter that. the market from those heifers. I think the, to me, one of the uh, sort of wild cards is you know how strong our export market stays and how much we grow that. We're going to go, I think, through tighter times, but how tight those times get, I think, is going to depend a lot on how we stimulate you, you could demand. you could expand the number of years where we're still growing the cow herd size if if we see some increased demand internationally. Yeah. yeah. And then the other kind of wild card that I know happens sometimes is if a wide area in the United States with that have a lot of the cows in it go through a drought period. So just forage, which is what prolonged one of the last ones because we sold off a bunch of cows when and it was which about fourteen fifteen. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't during go that part of the cow, that high. Yeah. cow cycle except for the fact that the forage was limited. A colleague of mine, Glenn Tonzer, and one of his PhD students, James Mitchell, did some stuff not too long ago looking at the structural change of the cattle cycle. And kind of part of the argument was as cows get bigger, heavier, they're producing more beef, so you might not need quite as many animals, cow, calves, to produce that same amount of beef. And so they went through some different things that they talked about, but if demand is kind of being held constant, you might not necessarily need more cows because they're larger. Our, our historical way of just counting noses, counting the number of cows, may not tell the whole story right. as far as the amount of supply and, out there. And that ten-year average might not be a ten-year average going forward. Maybe it's only an eight or a nine. Maybe it shrinks a little bit because we have more tonnage being produced. And so, there's some recent work at uh, AgManager.info if folks are interested in that. Excellent. At a macro or a big level, it's going to influence our price of calves. So I think it's important for everybody to kind of watch. Because we get the question, should we save heifers or not save heifers? Or how many should we save? And as you think about it, and that that probably be a good discussion topic for a longer discussion. Somewhat, it's related to some of these issues. Does is, mm-hmm. is it make yeah. sense? Although I would say you go with a strategy that works for you and figure out. Because everything you guys just told me, what I heard was, we don't know exactly. What, what it's going to do and when it's going to do it, we know in broad terms. So yeah. The continued focus on cost containment, you know, even in good calf prices, controlling input costs you know, augments profit opportunity. Yep. So that's maybe the only static strategy is keep a lid on costs as much as you can. From the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, that's Brad White, Bob Larson, Dustin Pendle, and Bob Weber. Listen to full episodes of the BCI Cattle Chat podcast at ksubci.org. Stay tuned for more here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. And welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Now a quick glimpse to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. And leading with this, the end appears in sight. Conferees for the 2018 Farm Bill filed their report last night. Posting that legislation on the House Rules Committee website, this paves the way for a House vote on the bill as early as tomorrow, with a Senate vote following shortly after. House Agriculture Committee staff briefed reporters late yesterday on the details of the bill, which includes changes to price loss coverage reference prices that would adjust higher with improved market conditions. Under the bill, the current reference prices for corn, soybeans, and wheat and reference prices for other commodities remain the same as the 2014 Farm Bill, but the new Farm Bill takes a plan from the House version that creates a five-year Olympic formula that would allow reference prices to move upward as much as 15 percent. Those higher reference prices would be used both in PLC and the Agricultural Risk Coverage, or ARC, program. The Farm Bill makes some other changes to the ARC program, including a trend yield adjustment and a provision that allows the USDA to divide some of the largest counties in the country into smaller units for county average yields. The USDA also will allow price loss coverage yield updates nationally in 2020 for all crops. In 2019, producers will be allowed to switch commodity programs. And in 2021, farmers will be allowed to annually switch back and forth if they choose between ARC and PLC. Base acres that have been planted to grass from 2019 to 2017 crop years will no longer be eligible for ARC or PLC programs. Instead, This farm bill will allow landowners to enroll those acres into a special five-year conservation stewardship program contract at $18 per acre. And the Farm Bill also includes raising marketing loan rates for most commodity crops as well. Soybeans will see a 24% increase in the marketing loan to $6.20 a bushel. Loan rates for corn and grain sorghum moving to $2.20 a bushel and $3.38 a bushel for wheat. The bill will allow nieces, nephews, and cousins to qualify for commodity program payments, maintaining the current individual payment limit remaining at $125,000. The bill also keeps the adjusted gross income limit for farm program recipients at the $900,000 a year level. And as reported here last week in our conversation with the University of Nebraska's Brad Lubin under the conservation title, the Conservation Reserve Program will be increased from 24 up to 27 million acres. Rental rates will be lowered to 85% of the average county rental rate for general sign-up, 90% of the average county rate for continuous sign-up. The USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service will be required to update those rental rates annually under the bill. And in crop insurance, the bill makes some minor improvements in the products for forage and grazing insurance, but little else changes that followed the mantra of farm groups that simply insisted Congress do no harm to insurance. The four leaders of the House and Senate Agriculture Committees issued statements last evening after the bill language was released, urging their fellow lawmakers to support the legislation. And again, a vote is expected potentially in the House as early as Wednesday and in the Senate shortly thereafter. You're tuned to Agriculture Today, and now this week's edition of Milk Lines. Standing by with that, K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers about coaching on their farm. You know, this time of year with different sports programs coming to the end of the seasons and others starting, there's a lot of talk about how we coach our teams and a lot of reflection as to, well, how did the team do and what was the coach responsible for versus the team? So we think about our dairies. How's your team doing? You know, as, as a manager or as an owner of the dairy, it is really your team. So when was the last time you had a team meeting, really talked about how things were going on the dairy, or we just kind of choosing to ignore the obvious and try to move through every day? You know, a lot of times on our dairies, that's really the way it goes. We've got work to do, and we tend to ignore some things and just kind of move through the day. Over time, that generally builds up frustration with our crew, 
and usually leads to sometimes people leaving, other times people just not maybe engaged as much as you'd like them in their job. So, when was the last time you did have a team meeting on your dairy? When's the next one due? You know, as the manager, as the owner, I think one of the really, really important things about these meetings is to just sit and listen to those that you have. And, you know, depending on the size of your farm, that may be some key management people around the table. It might be your whole crew. It just kind of depends on the situation. Smaller farms, we maybe sit down with everybody. And larger farms, maybe that meeting occurs with just our key management people and then the key management people have other meetings with the employees that are underneath them to communicate what needs to be communicated. So as a manager, make sure you sit and listen and make sure you watch body language at the meeting too. That'll let you know pretty quick whether or not a person feels comfortable actually talking at the table or not. If they're not comfortable talking at the table, it might be a good time for you to have maybe a private meeting at another time to figure out what's wrong maybe to get them a little bit more engaged. I'd encourage you to try to find some common ground during these meetings, some things that you guys can work together and try to solve. Finding common interest is also important as you meet with your employees. And try to find some things to celebrate as well. I know it's the holiday season and many times there are opportunities to do that, but it's always especially important any time we come together for these team meetings that we find something to mention that's on the positive side. It should never be a meeting that's simply all negative. So as you think about organizing the meetings, some important things to think about would be, well, why are we getting together? What's the purpose? What items do you want to communicate? What do you want input on from your fellow employees? Then, you need to devise a plan. If there's an issue that needs to be solved, come up with an action plan for that, execute the plan, and then take some time to evaluate whether or not the plan worked or if there's still some additional work to be done. If not, then it should be the time to celebrate. That should be part of your next team meeting. So again, I want to encourage our dairy farmers as we move through the winter season that we take time to evaluate things maybe get to know our employees a little bit better, and to institute team meetings if we haven't done that already on our dairies. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike, as always. Our weekly installment on wildlife management with Charlie Lee, next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today continues, and across the way once more is Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension. We'll learn more this week about the cottontail rabbit, including things that you quite possibly did not know about this greatly abundant species in Kansas, Charlie. Well, it's a species that is certainly still abundant in Kansas. However, the, the numbers of eastern cottontail rabbits that we have here in the Midwest has been declining uh, with not a really a known cause. Eastern cottontail is generally thought of as a habitat generalist, meaning they get along very well in common uh, landscapes. Those could be old fields, grasslands, uh, early successional woodland types, but they don't seem to do as well in larger t- landscapes that are more intensively cultivated, particularly when there are very few edges or perennial grasslands next to woodland cover. They need that cover for protection from predators and such? Well, they certainly have very specific habitat requirements, and those differ depending upon the age of the animal. When we think about the life history of a cottontail, let's talk firstly about uh, the breeding behavior. Mm -hmm. That's uh, some things that many people are probably not aware of. The, The male rabbit, or sometimes called the buck, would chase the doe, the doe then finally faces the, the buck. They spar with the front paws for a little while. 
then the, the male rabbit or the female rabbit will leap high into the air, and they may do that a couple of times prior to mating. Uh, 26 to 28 days later, you'll have a litter of rabbits that could be as many as nine, but most often is in numbers in four to five. I've been known to have as many as seven litters per season, but here in the in the Midwest, most of the time, those litters are born between the March and September time frames. So when the young are born, they're weaned at about three weeks of age, and then those young start foraging on succulent grasses and forbs and woody vegetation immediately after weaning. The food that's necessary in the habitat requirement table would be a wide variety of green vegetation, uh, woody plants, and cultivated crops. The green vegetation can be the, the native grasses, blue grasses, the common lawn grasses, brome. Also would include some of the forbs like clover, uh, dandelion, sedges, fruits, and garden vegetables are also very commonly consumed. The woody plants, I'm not sure that we have some that are really selected for, but the buds and branch tips and the bark of blackberries and sumac, uh, uh, cherry, oak, dogwood species are all very commonly found in food habit studies of the eastern cottontail. We l also look at cover as a very important element to avoid those predators that you mentioned. We need cover during nesting, we need cover during litter rearing, and we need winter cover. All three of those are lacking in larger landscape areas provided by intensive agricultural croplands. So if we don't have that cover, we certainly have predators like hawks and owls, coyotes, foxes, even dogs and cats, snakes that are going to consume a lot of those young rabbits. They do have some unique characteristics when trying to avoid predation. Uh, they practice what's often called freeze or flush. The rabbit, when startled, may freeze, try to blend in with the, the background with, and, and escape predation by camouflage. They may stay motionless for up to 10 minutes or even longer or they're going to simply flush and try to escape by rapidly uh, leaving the area in a kind of a zigzag fashion to avoid being captured by a predator. And the cover that they're trying to seek is that interspace between shrubby woodland habitat and grassy areas. They can get by and uh, will often crawl into burrows or under dropped trees and shrubs and wood piles. In the shrubby cover, they may burrow into very dense uh, shrub cover to avoid predation. But if you don't have that shrub cover in close proximity to the grassy areas, you're not going to have as many cottontail rabbits. Are they susceptible to disease? That's a notion that's out there among folks. Well, parasites and diseases are a natural occurrence in most species of wildlife. Rabbits are no exception. They can harbor fleas and ticks and tapeworms and other parasites, uh, but rarely is the rabbit negatively affected by those parasites. Bacterial tularemia, it's recognized as occurring in cottontail rabbits more often than in any other species, and that's something that many people that are hunting rabbits are concerned about. But tularemia can be transmitted to humans, but that's primarily through tick bites. But as we caution hunters, uh, be aware, try not to harvest rabbits that would be lethargic or not acting uh, normally, and then make sure you're being careful in your food preparation techniques. Lastly, you have some interesting numbers on uh, cottontail rabbit hunting take over the last few years, and that has been dwindling, you say. Yes, uh, that's something that kind of su was surprising to me that at times we've harvested over a half a million rabbits in Kansas uh, in a year. Those would have been numbers in the 1960s. Currently, the, the rabbit harvest is down uh, about one-tenth of that with a harvest of about 60,000 rabbits each year by hunters. We have one-fifth of the number of rabbit hunters as we did in the 1960s. They're spending twice as long of hunting rabbits to harvest just half as many. So the recent survey information from the Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism shows about 12,000 hunters harvested 60,000 rabbits. 
and averaged about a little over one day specifically rabbit hunting. So it's certainly not a, a species that's real actively pursued across the state. I think there are still many people out there that enjoy rabbit hunting, but there are also folks out there that are concerned about the, the rabbits in urban, suburban landscapes, and even in some cases in cultivated croplands along the edges. Well, it's by no means an endangered species by any stretch, Charlie. No, it's certainly not a, a species that's threatened or endangered, but when, if you look at the data, something that's declined by a factor of 10, perhaps we need to be looking at these early uh, indications before they become something much more serious. Well, there's some background and once more some facts that you may not have been aware of concerning the eastern cottontail rabbit. Charlie, thanks, as always. Charlie Lee, wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension. With that, our time's away for today. As always, thanks to you for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.